Welcome, uh, a welcome from my side. Uh, let's, I'm, I'm slowly starting into this session. We got uh, uh, a full hour and a bit, uh, so uh, there'll, there'll be time for questions and uh, we can take time for some detours if necessary, which I really appreciate for this topic. Uh, so welcome to this session on, on uh, Spring Framework 5. I will do a little bit of general Spring Framework 5 coverage, but not much because uh, you are being exposed to it everywhere here anywhere, right? So you're seeing it in so many demos uh, in, 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 in some form, right? As a part of uh, Spring Boot to the Low being shown, as, as part of the wet flux story, uh, uh, as part of the Kotlin story later this afternoon in the Spring Loves Kotlin talk. Um, so there are many different perspectives highlighted already at this uh, conference. And uh, for that reason, I, I, I chose to take a, a, a specific perspective for this one as well. So we're talking about, we'll be talking about Spring from 5.0 in the context of its use of JDK 8 and 9. It's, um, it's the inspirations that it takes from JDK 8 and 9, the uh, specific measures uh, that we, we, we have been applying uh, for its uh, uh, usability on, on, on JDK 9 and higher. This is a pretty broad uh, talk in that sense. Right? We'll still be talking about uh, many related uh, efforts, but uh, uh, fundamentally it is what uh, it is a key, it, it's a key motivation for what we're doing, right? Uh, a, a new Spring Framework major release is usually associated with uh, uh, a raise in the JDK baseline and also with uh, um, embracing a new JDK generation. Spring Framework 5 though, is a great example, right? It, it literally went GA uh, a few days after JDK 9 GA. So Spring Framework 5 is the release that is basically designed to embrace JDK 9 from day one. And it also raises the baseline to JDK 8 plus. Whereas uh, if you remember, Spring Framework 4 uh, still is JDK 6 baseline. We'll get into that. All right, so um, the overview for a start, right? Um, we are only going to talk about the JDK aspects of this really, uh, but uh, Spring Framework 5 does a qu quite a few related things. It, it embraces JDK 9, it embraces Kotlin, it embraces reactive architectures and Project Reactor in particular from the core up to the uh, web layer, uh, several different uh, parts of the story, uh, Spring Data K, the messaging architectures. There are many, many related efforts where, where those things shine through, both the Kotlin support, the Kotlin extensions, and, and Project Reactor. Um, the race in the baseline that I've mentioned, Nadi being, being uh, JDK 8 plus, Java 8 plus being a formal requirement now, is really an enabler for many things, which in the first half of this talk, I'm going to elaborate on, on quite a few of the things we can do now that we couldn't do before when we didn't have a Java 8 baseline. Um, and of course, we also raise the baseline in other areas, right? So the 3.1 plus, basically a Java E7 baseline, uh, 3.1 plus, JPA 2.1 plus. Um, and uh, the same kind of reasoning applies not only to the JDK, you know, 8 as a baseline, 9 as the new one to embrace. We have the same kind of uh, uh, reasoning for Java E, Java E7 as the baseline, at the same time embracing the Java E8 level of specifications, of APIs in particular, uh, that is Solid 4.0, Bean Validation 2.0, uh, JPA 2.2 in particular, the ones that we really care about. And uh, a new one that comes into the picture here is the JSON Binding API, which is essentially just an alternative to Google JSON, which again is an alternative to the very commonly used Jackson uh, library in Spring, right? But in, uh, in, in Spring Boot 2.0, many of those things actually shine through, so if you uh, put the uh, uh, JSON binding provider onto the class path, Spring Boot will configure it by default. But basically, we will configure it by default and it shines through in Boot and uh, there's dependency management for it. All right, um, a few further, two, two further things I'd like to, to uh, mention on a more general note. There's a really distinctive change in focus in terms of, uh, of what we're doing uh, for the usage model and for, for, for newly introduced configuration APIs. 
we used to have a strong annotation focus. We still have a strong annotation focus, right? It kind of is, it's, a, it's of course a, a, a very ongoing effort, uh, even at, at this day. And Spring Framework 5.0 brings quite a few refinements to the annotation-based model. But most of those refinements were actually happening in 4.3. So um, if you remember our recent release history, Spring Framework 4.3 is uh, our mid-2016 release. Um, which uh, uh, wasn't actually planned up front. Uh, we, we, we knew that Spring Framework 5 would take a little bit longer, so we decided to do a 4.3 iteration. Um, in many ways, 4.3 brought some refinements, many refinements actually, forward to the 4.x line that otherwise would have ended up in 5.0. You could almost see it as an early backport. So what you, what, you, what you got in Spring Framework 4.3 for, for more than a year, one and a half years already, is basically an early backport of things that could have been 5.0 only. Um, but the, the, those things were really a great fit with the themes in Spring Framework 4. Annotation-based uh, handler methods, annotation -based, the annotation-based injection model in general. Um, those refinements really made a lot of sense in that context. So that's why they, they, they really fit nicely in 2.4.3 here. In Spring Framework 5, the uh, distinctive change in perspective is the focus on programmatic usage, programmatic registration, and um, functional style, as we're calling it, right? If we say functional, and we'll, I'll probably mention that term a few further times uh, in, in, in this presentation. So we always mean functional as in Java 8 functional. Basically, the Java util function package. Java util streams, collection streams in Java 8. The use of lambdas and method references, APIs that are designed, really, really designed to be used with lambdas and method references in a very concise and uh, um, um, comprehensive way, right? Uh, where uh, nobody would ever try to use anonymous in the classes for them. Those kinds of APIs. If we mean functional the same way that Java 8 means functional. And uh, the whole functional API registration topic is really a very broad effort on our end. There's a little, a little bit of surface, and uh, you'll, you'll see a bit of this later in this presentation. Uh, some things you can do, some new APIs that are available to you now, uh, some new variants of APIs that are available to you now, that's all fine. But we really mean those things at a deeper level. Um, so by, by uh, revisiting the entire code base, uh, all the programmatic APIs, um, uh, we, we started adding explicit nullability declarations in the entire code base because those are particularly useful for functional APIs and in particular for the Kotlin compiler where uh, in, with the use of the Kotlin language, explicit nullability indications allow for assignments that otherwise the compiler would not accept. So we actually revisited many related topics like clean formal declarations of basically each and every uh, method in Spring API, whether the return value can ever be null, whether input parameters are potentially meant to be null. So this was really a, a, a much more extensive effort uh, than it uh, might initially look like. And the, the uh, functional as in Java 8 part is kind of the mainstream model. We, we totally understand that uh, uh, Java 8 or the Java language in general by far is the dominant choice and will remain the dominant choice for many years to come, there's no doubt about that. But Kotlin is a great inspiration because, in particular because of its functional features, not just because of those, but in particular for those. Uh, it's a great inspiration that all, also kind of cycles back to our API design, where we come up with a more well-baked, well-thought-out uh, uh, choices uh, at the API level that need to make sense both in the Java 8 language context and in the Kotlin language context. It, it's basically like with creating abstractions, right? I mean, those are not really abstractions. It's, it's API design. But uh, um, like with abstractions, if you really need two different implementations, you need to be challenged by different uh, characteristics in order to arrive at a proper abstraction. The same applies to API design. You need to be challenged or to challenge yourself from different angles in order to arrive at uh, the best possible outcome that you could produce today. All right, so this is really a, a kind of something to keep in mind here. And in terms of the usage model, um, none of those 
really compete with each other or try to replace each other. There is, of course, a very comprehensive annotation-based programming model and a very comprehensive annotation-based configuration model that keeps being the reference point for many things and keeps being the mainstream model, even in Spring Framework 5. There's no doubt about this. We just chose to provide an alternative perspective through functional registration models, where intentionally you could choose to avoid annotations completely, where you could choose to avoid reflection completely, where you could register your beans and your web endpoints and your messaging endpoints and whatever it is through programmatic facilities, not even touching component scanning in the class path. And even avoiding reflection to quite some degree, if you wanted to, you could even avoid uh, reflection completely. Um, this is a really, these, are, these are really great challenges for us as framework designers, if you think about it, right? Because uh, it's kind of an extreme position to take. We don't expect anybody to try to avoid reflection in an, in an entire app. But as, as an extreme position, it is really helpful in making sure that the framework could accommodate such more radical requirements if there was really a need to. And of course, there may be a need to. In microservices architecture, certain microservices may totally benefit from this highly optimized, uh, purely programmatic, reflection-avoiding style of configuration. Whereas uh, larger scale, uh, general application setups might not really do much, why it might just not make a difference. All right, so much for a bit of background. And the, uh, I, I have to show it at least quickly before we move on. Uh, the whole uh, WebFlex topic, of course, is very essential. Just double checking uh, that everybody's aware that in Spring Framework 5, there is basically the traditional servlet-based Spring Web MVC stack. And in parallel to it, there is a, uh, the WebFlex stack. And there's great mixing and matching here. Those, are, those really co-evolve. Those really uh, uh, allow for some nice mixing and matching where the WebFlux reactive web client can be used in a Spring MVC endpoint on a server 3.1 container. There's a lot of mixing and matching. The usage models on top, the add control, add request mapping model is really intentionally very consistent between those two worlds. So that things that can uh, work on the, uh, the same way, in the same structures, with the same, the same uh, signature design, uh, are not artificially different between those two worlds. So we, we are really co-evolving those stacks. And there's some, some nice uh, uh, outcomes already in Spring Framework 5, and this is going to, uh, in, in 5.0, and this is going to continue in 5.1 and 5.2. So if you are looking at everything we're doing in Spring Framework 5.0, basically see it as, as, as choices and as a toolbox. There are many different ways of combining your, your choices, right? You may choose functional registration uh, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with WebFlex endpoints. You may, you may use the annotation-based model with WebFlex endpoints. You may use the annotation-based model on MVC endpoints. There's a, a lot, lots of mixing and matching, lots of fine-tuning where you need it. So uh, we, we, we don't do black and white uh, pitches we understand that there's lots of shades of gray in between, uh, and those we give basically some first-class love to this mixing and matching of the options. So if, if anything doesn't work, for example, we would of course see that as a bug, right, if uh, things need to mix and match properly, uh, unless there's a strong technical reason why they can't. All right, so much for a little bit of uh, uh, general coverage of uh, the uh, design motivation behind the things that we're doing in Spring Framework 5. Now, for the uh, next uh, part, let's focus on the role of the JDK 8 baseline, right? Basically, we, we very early on decided to uh, make Spring Framework 5 a JDK 8 plus generation of the framework, where, where Spring Framework 4 was JDK 6 based, so there's no JDK 7 based generation of Spring, at least not of the core framework. Uh, simply because it, w it wouldn't buy us anything. Right? It, it, we can just as well keep JDK 6 compatibility. JDK 7 doesn't, for us as framework developers, doesn't really change the picture uh, to a degree where we would not be able to accommodate it through runtime adaptation. So uh, uh, we kept that for Spring Framework 4 and then jumped straight to 8 for Spring Framework 5. But you might think like, doesn't Spring Framework 4.3 already deliver a lot of Java 8 support? 
Yes, it does, of course, and that's a quite important uh, uh, point in its own right. In Spring for Mac 4, Spring for Mac 4.0GA was already coming with a lot of early Java 8 support, three months before the JDK 8 GA release. This, this was a very important part of the Spring for Mac 4 mission statement. It was, JD, it was Java 6 baselined, so the, the framework itself was Java 6 and 7 compatible, but it brought a lot of first class Java 8 support already. In a form that we carefully crafted over the years, right? Uh, we, we know how to do those things. We, we use runtime adaptation. We basically see your code, we understand your code, we see your signatures and your handler methods and your injection points. We see your use of Java 8 API constructs. Uh, we adapt to them, right? If you declare a Java util optional in Spring Framework 4, that's a Java 8 only API type, but at runtime, we, we have, uh, we, we baked some understanding into the framework so that at runtime it knows how to resolve a Java util optional reference for you when you're asking for it in an injection point, when you're asking for it in a handler method parameter. So there's a lot of Java 8 support, really rich Java 8 support in Spring Framework for the 3 already, but it all happens through runtime adaptation. It's pretty efficient. Uh, there's really no downside to this. Uh, the framework simply says, I'm running on Java 8. I activate all sorts of Java 8 support automatically for you um, so that when you're using it for application development, Spring Framework like Photo 3 essentially feels like a Java 8-based framework to you already. But it's important it feels like a Java 8-based framework, right? In terms of its behavior, it actually isn't underneath the covers. Um, there's also lots of foresight that we're trying to take into account here, right? So we knew where things would be going and uh, uh, what we could be doing once we have a, a fully Java 8-based framework here. Uh, so in, uh, in, in the photo X line, photo 1, photo 2, photo 3, there were many refinements that were already preparations for what's coming next. And um, well, this is where we are now, right, in terms of Java 8 adoption. Uh, basically, uh, this, this survey was uh, just a week or two after the Spring Framework 5.0 GA launch. It was actually, the f uh, I, I was quite impressed by the level of Java 8 adoption. I mean, take service with a big grain of salt, right? Everybody's basically polling the audiences that they're able to reach for, for a start. But it is quite indicative, and we have other indications uh, suggesting the same kind of adoption numbers. Java 8 basically is three quarters of, uh, of the landscape right now out there. Um, plus, minus a bit, right? Depending on which environment you, you may be in and which uh, domain you may be working in. Uh, there, there's a few noticeable uh, aspects to this. Uh, Java 7 is, of course, the red part. Um, Java 6 is really fading out, the, the, this yellowish part. The, um, the Java 6 story actually is uh, very much a, a topic in its own right. We recently de declared the end of first class Java 6 support, JDK 6 support on our end. We keep shipping Spring Framework 4.3.x maintenance releases that are Java 6 compatible at runtime, but we don't take first class actions against uh, Java 6 support anymore. Meaning we're really joining Oracle uh, and IBM in, uh, in their fading out of Java 6. Because IBM is actually fading it out in April. As of April 2018, you can't get IBM to support any use of Java 6 anymore. Not even in, uh, in, uh, in traditional web sphere environments, really. And uh, Oracle declares the end of uh, extended commercial Java 6 support uh, late next year, uh, in, in December next year already. So we're basically just joining those efforts in fading out Java 6. And those, those uh, support numbers really indicate uh, that this is worth doing. So if you have any, any, for example, a bug in the JDK that materializes in some spring usage context, and it only shows in JDK 6, an upgrade to JDK 7 would solve the problem, then that's exactly what we'll be asking you, right? Please upgrade to JDK 7. We are not going to add workarounds just for Java 6 to our code base anymore. Right, so three quarters on Java 8. This is, of course, a perfect companion uh, to Spring Framework 5 being Java 8 baseline, right? Uh, and it's immediately usable, according to those uh, numbers, it's immediately usable in three quarters of the deployment environments out there. So um, the Java 8 baseline is primarily a topic for us, 
I openly admit that, right? The greatest benefit is for us in maintaining the code base. Also for you, if you're an active contributor, if you happen to be an active uh, uh, a submitter of pull requests to us, right? It's now Java, a Java 8 code base. It can internally use uh, uh, lambdas and, and method references, finally. It uh, can internally use Java 8 API types. It can interact with collection streams. It, uh, um, it can declare default methods in, uh, in interfaces. We, we're going to get to that in, in, in some more detail. And we can actively use unconditionally use uh, Java 8 API constructs, such as uh, Java Lang Reflect Executable, which is the new base class between construct and method, uh, or a Java Util Concurrent Completable Future. We can use the Java.time types. Uh, for example, instant, duration, uh, which are actually quite useful in API design. We can finally do this because we can use them in places in the code base, in hard, static signatures that don't need to be Java 6 compatible anymore. We can declare them anywhere down the stack uh, internally or, of course, also in user, in, in, user visible, um, in user visible API surface, in hard signatures in interfaces and classes, constructors, methods. Um, that, uh, that sort of enabler is really what the Java 8 baseline brings us, and uh, we're going to see a few, a few benefits from, from those efforts. Um, the, Annotation-based variants, of course, were already reflectively adapting anyway. So there, there, there was some nice interoperability that you could do. If you were calling APIs that returned completable future, you could return them uh, to, to places in Spring, right, to the handler method support in Spring, and uh, there would be adapters that know what to do with it. Um, but now, of course, there is actually programmatic adaptation methods. There's an unlistenable future. You can ask it to uh, return uh, uh, itself as a completable future. Um, that sort of thing, right? So uh, this also matches really nicely with uh, the programmatic design perspective, the functional usage model, where those facilities need to be available in a convenient form as classic programmatic APIs, including the adaptation code uh, between Java.time and uh, <coughs> other, other representations, or uh, in particular in the Java Util concurrent space. That is really beneficial. So the, uh, the topic of default methods, it's actually a, uh, in a one of the more, um, more advanced uh, 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 language refinements that they did in Java 8, right? Uh, you could even argue somewhat radical, because in Java 8, if you're declaring an interface, you may start adding bodies to certain methods in your interface. So uh, um, previously, of course, interfaces were totally abstract were just allowed to contain abstract method declarations. And now some of those methods may be declared as a default method uh, with a default implementation if the implementing class does not actually provide an implementation of a particular method. This is really, really useful for framework and library developers, not just for us, I would argue, but in particular for us. We can add new methods to existing interfaces not breaking existing implementations because the new methods can have default uh, implementations in the interface, um, which keeps existing classes working even if the users, the callers, start using those new methods. Um, this, of course, is also being used in the JDK libraries itself a lot, right? If you, if you look at uh, Java Util Collections, uh, uh, the, the, there's tons of new methods on Java Util Map and, and, and Co all declared as default methods, keeping existing map implementations uh, working. We are using the same kind of model, um, and we revisited everything we have in the code base, both the APIs and in particular the SPIs, and started adding default implementations to, to uh, well, any, any sensible declaration where that makes sense. For example, in the Bean Post Processor SPI, in even the Factory Bean SPI, um, there is a couple of, of uh, default methods now in the resource abstraction, in, uh, in listenable future, and those are not necessarily types that you would implement, but the, some extensions might implement them, right? It's, it's a great benefit to us if we can add methods to those and existing extensions, pre-compiled extensions that you grab from Maven Central uh, are still binary compatible here. And if you have a need to implement, for example, a Beam Post Processor yourself, you don't need to have stub implementations anymore. Uh, and you don't need to extend from an, an, a base class, from an abstract adapter base class anymore. You just 
implement the interface directly, and the only methods that you actually declare in your implementation are the ones that you care about. For the rest, you leave the default methods in action. So this, this is not just a matter for backwards compatibility when we're adding new methods. It's also a measure for convenience in existing interfaces. Bean Postprocessor does, does not have any new methods in it. It has the same two methods that it always had. But both of them are declared as default methods, and you can choose to just override implement one of the two. Uh, you don't have to stop out the other. That's essentially a matter of uh, convenience that we can finally provide through the use of the Java 8 default method feature. Uh, another great example is uh, the integration APIs. Uh, transaction synchronization, you might not implement that callback too often, but it has plenty of callbacks. Uh, they are now all, uh, they have all default methods, right? And you can just implement the one that you really care about, despite the callback interface having several methods. Or oh, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the web space, uh, the handler interceptor callback, same, same kind of idea. Now, in terms of um, the aforementioned programmatic registration of beans, um, there's, of course, some, some really nice Java 8 language interaction uh, happening here, right? So just to give you a, a, an indication of, uh, of how Java 8 really um, kind of shows its benefits here, if, if you register two, two, um, um, two beans, one of type foo and one of type bar, as of Spring for McFi, you, would, you could just instantiate the good old generic application context, a class that has been around for 10 plus years, and then start registering beans with what we call instance suppliers and uh, bean definition customizers. So in the, in the first example above, um, if, you, if we look at the, the bar uh, registration, we're basically saying register a, a, a new bean of type bar, and here's an instance supplier, which is literally a Java util function supplier implementation that creates a new instance of that particular bean whenever it is needed. So, which means the container is still in charge of the lifecycle, can lazily initialize the singleton, can create a prototype or a scoped bean instances whenever needed. Um, and the way to actually create them is not reflective introspection of the available constructors and reflective invocation of one of those constructors. It's totally different. It's a straight dispatching to the uh, provided instance supplier. In such, such a model, you, don't, you wouldn't actually see any reflection in action at runtime. So the, this dispatching to a, an embedded Lambda expression in this case uh, actually uses invoke dynamic at runtime, so it's a, it's a straight a dispatch uh, in the bytecode to the method that you provided, to the body of the method that you provided. In uh, the second example, we have uh, a slightly more refined version where uh, the, uh, the bar registration provides a first lambda expression, right? This, this first little expression is the instance supplier, then comma. The next expression is what we call a bean definition customizer, the BD set lazy init one, right? It's a bean definition customizer where we're saying, uh, here's the bean definition that we're about to register. Would you want to add some additional metadata, for example? Setting lazy init flag, uh, uh, the init flag, adding attributes or qualifiers, modifying any of its characteristic. This is the bean definition model that we, we've been having for, uh, for 15 years now, right? This, the, the underlying bean definition metadata is what, what everybody uh, goes down to. XML bean definitions translate to bean definition objects. Programmatic registrations translate to bean definition objects as well. There can be any number of such customizers. It's a var arc. So if you have several flags to set, you don't need to go into an like an embedded code block. You could just have another comma, another BD coming in, and another method to call for customization on that incoming bean definition. Uh, there's another little twist here, uh, in case you might have uh, noticed. Uh, another little twist in the foo new part. Uh, so the reg registration of foo in the second example down here uses, uses an instance supplier. This is an instance supplier. It's another Java 8 language feature in action method references, right? Wherever you can use Lambda expressions, you can use method references. This is a Java 8 uh, method reference to the default constructor in your foo class with the colon colon syntax in, in Java 8. So the, the compiler is actually going to supply a direct dispatch to the default constructor in foo for us. This isn't really that different from the example above, but above, we're essentially using class new instance, and class new instance is reflection, technically. 
So by supplying an instant supplier down here for foo new, you're technically providing us with an optimization to instantiate your class without the use of reflection. So just, this is basically connecting back to uh, the motivation before, where for rather extreme uh, conditions that you're trying to take into account, you can really optimize hard here to a degree that wasn't quite possible before. And in another part of uh, uh, our uh, core framework um, here, we, we also allow for the registration of uh, um, web endpoints in a functional style. And of course, this also makes heavy use of Java 8 language features. Actually, there are quite a few Java 8 language features in action here. Um, so this is a router function, a programmatically composed router function that says for two different incoming web endpoints, we're providing a handler function as an embedded lambda code block. And this, and this embedded block basically receives the request. Whenever a matching request comes in, it receives the request and it is supposed to do some stuff, um, providing a, a server response uh, with a, a body typically composed from a reactive streams publisher. Not really, too, not really the topic that we are spending extra time on today, but this is basically the functional usage model, the functional registration model for Spring Web Floods in action. So in terms of Java 8 language features, we have um, well, we have two embedded code blocks here, not an inline lambda expression, but two actually code blocks that are still being applied as a, as a, a multi-line lambda code block. We have the use of static imports, of course, not, not, not a brand new language feature, but used nicely here, in case you're wondering where does, the, where does the route method come from, right? Static imports from router functions. So uh, there's, there's even some really nice interaction of say, more, more recent Java language features coming together here in one form. All right, we are not the only ones to um, um, go there, right, to, to really upgrade the entire code base and the, entra, the entire API surface uh, to a Java 8 plus world. Uh, J, they recently released JUnit 5 that we have explicit support for in Spring Framework 5.0. Uh, is, is essentially the same kind of thing. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a key difference. JUnit 5 is basically a re-implementation of the JUnit framework. Totally new SPI design. It's quite different from JUnit 4. I mean, it has a similar usage model, but the framework itself is a fresh new implementation. Um, it is Java 8 baseline, that's, that's great. A great fit for Spring Framework 5. Uh, but what we've been doing is to take the existing framework including all of its existing usage, uh, all the existing applications, all the existing extensions, and upgrade it to Java 5 without any breakage of binary compatibility. JUnit 5 had the more fortunate situation of not having to take, take uh, backwards compatibility into account as to the same degree that we do. But anyway, they, it's a nice companion. Uh, Project Reactor in its uh, third generation, Project Reactor 3 or 3.1 right now, is also Java 8 based. Uh, that's a great example for the benefits of what a uh, uh, Java 8 based reactive library can do because in Reactor, there's plenty of composition APIs. On Flux and Mono, there are many APIs that allow you to take uh, different kinds of existing callbacks and kind of translate them to publishers, build them into a, pu a chain of publishers, a sequence of interaction with publishers. Um, and it's really, really beneficial to be able to refer to things like completable future, the Java util function types, consumer, um, uh, and so forth in, in, um, in the uh, standard React APIs. Why am I stressing that point? Because it's a quite unique feature in React. If you look at RxJava, even RxJava 2, RxJava 2 is Java 6 baselined. So it, it, it is not able to take the, uh, the, the new Java 8-isms into account to the same degree. Reactor 3 is really the only of the, uh, the, only, the only reactive composition library that is fully Java 8 baseline out there. Well, others, of course, any Servlet 4 container like Tomcat 9, but also existing Servlet 3.1 containers like JD9394, they are all Java 8 based for quite a while. Um, Hibernate is as of 5.2, also Java 8 based, which, well, they, they could go further, I would argue, in uh, their use of Java 8 language constructs, but at least uh, they're making some use of, uh, uh, of Java 8 features like repeatable annotation declarations. 
um, which I don't see as, as, as big a deal, but uh, they nevertheless made the choice to, to uh, ship a uh, uh, Java 8-based version of Hibernate uh, mid last year already. And for Hibernate Validator 6 as a Bean Validation 2 implementation has to be Java 8 based as well. So many of the recent versions, the recent major releases of the commonly used open source frameworks out there, open source libraries out there, are also Java 8 baselined, really joining the club. So 2017 is when those things come together and agree that it's worth doing Java 8 based releases now. All right, let's move on to um, JDK 9 and the inspiration and, 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 and efforts that we had uh, around JDK9. Um, I'll, I'll get to that at the very end. When we say JDK9, um, we really mean JDK9 and higher. So as I've mentioned this morning as well, JDK9 itself is not a long-term support release. Uh, it, it brings most of the features. It's the first release that ships this, this ton of features. Um, uh, but it is not actually what you are going to adopt. If you say 9 now, JDK 9 now, you really have to upgrade to JDK 10 in March, April next year. And you have to upgrade to JDK 11 in September, October next year. Um, because Oracle's going to stop publishing updates to JDK 9 in March next year. Um, so we'll get to that at the very end in terms of upgrade recommendations. Uh, but anytime I'm saying JDK 9, what I really mean is 9 slash 10 slash 11. So, um, in, all, in all applicable brevity here, JDK 9 brings a lot of goodness. So, to, 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 to set that totally straight, a lot, lots of improvements in JDK 9 are so worth having that the upgrade is, uh, even just for, 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 the, for runtime reasons, for the JVM improvements, for, for uh, totally transparent runtime benefits that you can apply to existing applications, it's definitely worth considering. I, I'm personally pragmatic enough to understand that uh, Java 8 is going to be with us for many years to come and uh, many environments out there are Java 8 based and will remain Java 8 based for years to come. At the same time, I highly recommend familiarizing yourself with the benefits that JDK 9 can bring to your environments. Um, and uh, yeah, upgrade recommendations are going to follow at the end of this of this presentation uh, in, 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 in a few more details. So there's, for example, the garbage collection refinements. Uh, G1 is now the default. Uh, um, there's the compact strings model. There's startup time improvements. Um, there's the ability to, to create custom JVM distributions using JLink. Um, uh, but even, even for, uh, let's take compact strings, right? Even compact strings on its own is so worth having. If you have a string in an encoding that can be represented by one byte per character, then it's going to do that by default, totally transparently. That may significantly reduce the kind of uh, static memory consumption um, in, in your application. Uh, the memory, uh, significantly improve the memory profile of a particular microservice that you're deploying without any changes of code on your end, without even recompiling your code. You could take existing Java 8 based code compiled with target 1.8, an existing deployment unit unchanged and run it on Java 9. Just set Java home to 9 and run it and you get, you get those benefits totally transparently. The way that they implemented this is actually really nice. And of course, at the same time, there are many API refinements. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, the runtime benefits to me are actually the most important part. The, uh, upgraded, the upgraded SSL stack. The upgraded, uh, uh, um, there's generally the upgraded infrastructure in JDK 9 is kind of ready for modern day, for example, HTTP 2 setup out of the box. That alone is a huge benefit, not having to customize a Java 8 distribution in order to get a, um, uh, the, the TLS stack ready for HTTP 2. So for example, running Tomcat 8.5 or, or 9 um, with an HTTP 2 setup is significantly more streamlined on, on, on JDK 9. And of course, there's the module system, right? I almost see it in that order. That's a bit, that's a, that's a quite personal uh, order here, right? Uh, the, uh, personally, I care most about the runtime improvements, the HTTP2 setup, and then comes Jigsaw, not the other way around. All right. There are a few new APIs in JDK 9. We'll, um, uh, so even if I'm talking about runtime 
runtime improvements here, there are a few interesting new APIs. And let, let's, single, let's single out uh, three areas. Uh, I'm not going into more detail here. I do believe, as far as I remember uh, seeing his talk, Simon Ritter is going into more detail on, on most of those in his 55 new features in JDK 9 talk. There is a repackaging that's quite noteworthy for what we're doing, right? Uh, there's a repackaging of reactive streams. JDK 9 actually contains the reactive streams abstraction, but not in org reactive streams. It, act, it has a different representation called Java Util Concurrent Flow, where the reactive streams publisher subscription subscriber model uh, are nested types within Flow. It's the exact same type, same semantics. Um, that's kind of interesting, but um, unfortunately, it's currently without a proper audience, right? There are no actual stakeholders for this. There are no implementations of Java Util Concurrent Flow publishers. And I, I'm not aware of any consumers either. Because everybody uses the canonical version from org reactive streams, the one that you can get from Maven Central that works fine on Java 8 and 9. There's no need to tie yourself to the Java Util Concurrent ver uh, Flow version in 9, really. So it's currently more of a, yes, it's there. It's kind of a nice signal that it's important, but uh, it's not actually really useful. There, there might be libraries that are JDK 9 plus at some point that are based on Java Util Concurrent Flow. Personally, I don't see it happening, not for years to come. But it, there, there might be some reactive data store drivers, some new releases of Arcs Java, whatever, being Java 9 based and using Java Util Concurrent Flow natively may happen. So uh, side note, in Spring Framework 5, 5.0, uh, uh, we actually do support the Java Util Concurrent Flow types. So if, if you um, design a WebFlux endpoint that returns a Java Util Concurrent Flow publisher to us, we know what to do with it. We adapt it to a regular Reactive Streams publisher for you and run it through our embedded project reactor kernel. So we, we can actually deal with it. If you happen to have a driver or if you implemented uh, something yourself that uh, is based on Java Util Concurrent Flow, we can very directly uh, interact with it. We are just not aware of a use case, uh, really. I would strongly recommend to stick with the Org Reactive Streams version like everybody else does for the time being. So that's kind of a nice signal, but not really important in practice. Uh, the second one, collection factory methods, are actually super useful. It's probably the most useful API refinement in all of Java 9. Factory methods on the set list and map interfaces, saying set off and there, here's a few elements, giving you a, a, an, 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 an optimized, immutable representation of those few elements as a set. We should have had that for 10 years, ideally, right? It's, wh 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 why do we only get this now? It's, it's almost... No, they, everybody does static blocks with new hash set, adding the methods, collections, unmodifiable set. It's like, ah. This, this is how it should have been for at least uh, for 10 years, right, as of Java 5. At least we have it now, right? Let's, let, let's keep a positive uh, attitude. Uh, at least we have it now, right? So if, if your code is actually compiled with source 9, if you actually start using the Java 9 language level and the Java 9 API level in particular, you can start using set of list of map of. Strictly speaking, it's actually sufficient to compile against the Java 9 libraries, but practically it really goes along with uh, your use of, uh, proper use of the Java 9 level. Um, and there are a few interesting extensions to the Stream API. So stream, the Stream API and Java Util Optional introduced in Java 8 have significant refinements in 9, which is kind of interesting. Some of them are conveniences. The take while drop while methods are kind of interesting on Stream, quite useful in practice. Um, like optional, stream has now an off-nullable, and uh, like collections, optional now has a stream method returning a Java Util stream for this single element or for, for the, the, this non-existing element in optional. So uh, bridging between APIs that really expect a, a, a Java Util stream, uh, it, ma it, makes, it makes some of those things significantly more useful in API design, but unfortunately, it's only in Java 9, so uh, you can only really use it in your code if you choose to use Java 9, you're not going to see any use of this in current frameworks and libraries, really, at this point. Right, now let's move on to the elephant in the room, right? Um, to uh, uh, the module system. For a start, the module system comes in several facets, right? Um, we're going to get into the application level usage model in, in, in a bit. But for a start, what they really 
accomplished here is a complete restructuring of the JDK's internals. The JDK itself is totally modular from, from the ground up now. They decomposed the JDK itself, in particular the JDK class libraries, into a, a quite extensive set of modules that you can individually choose to activate or deactivate in, a, in any particular uh, uh, setup of yours. So the, those, those modules f come with a, a new module namespace. There's the core module, the java.base module. There's the module that contains JDBC. It's called java.sql. Uh, the activation framework is separate now. Even Java util logging is separate now. GNDI is separate. JXP is separate. So in java.base, you really only get the essentials of, um, of uh, uh, what you need to see in terms of the JDK class libraries. Those names um, may look a little like package names, but they aren't. They are module names. So the java.logging module contains java util logging as a package, right? The java.sql module contains java.sql and java.x.sql, all, all, all the interfaces that come with JDBC. Um, so java.activation comes with the java.x.activation package. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a distinctive module namespace in, in, in place here, um, separate from the contained packages. Uh, a few interesting measures that they took, right, is uh, you can customize a setup, uh, just having a JVM distribution containing a certain selection of modules only, but not anything else, so significantly reducing the JVM distribution size. Um, there is the ability to uh, replace providers that come with the JDK with a choice of your own providers. Um, to some degree, they are winding back to the pre-Java 6 days here. If uh, some of you may have followed the JDK's evolution like 10 years ago, uh, Java 5 was st uh, still a pretty clean setup, and in Java 6, they started adding JXP, JXWS, an embedded HTTP server, the activation framework. It all, all of a sudden, all of that came with, with the standard JDK distribution. It was just on your class path with a couple of disadvantages, like try to upgrade your JXP provider. Back in the original Java 6, that was really hard. Um, so to some degree, in JDK 9, they are undoing this. The, the core JDK setup, the standard the default modules that are active are more, more, more of a classic JDK 5 style mindset again. Anything else like a JXP provider, uh, or, or, yeah, like JXWS or even anything more extensive has to be added separately, either by adding the module as a command line flag while it's still being shipped with the JDK, or actually preferably by bringing in your own choice of provider from, from Maven Central, for example. Um, some modules are even explicitly deprecated, like common annotations, the Java X dot annotation package uh, is actually, the module is deprecated, the types aren't, right? It basically means they don't want to ship that module in the JDK anymore. They don't want to include it in the JDK distribution anymore. And in some future distribution, which we actually, maybe even JDK 11 next year, those modules might not be part of the JDK distribution anymore. If you want to consume the common annotations or JXP or JXWS or anything else in that list, you have to bring them in separately. For the time being, they are still there. You can, active, you can, you can activate the module if you choose to do so, um, but you can also easily replace it with a provider of your choice. From a framework design perspective, that's quite interesting. Um, since originally we, we, we considered all of those things optional, when we were Java 6 baseline, in particular Spring Framework 4, uh, 3, and then in particular 4, we started having a JDK underneath us uh, that came with all of those things out of the box. So all those things were all of a sudden always there. We didn't have to have defensive checks against them anymore. Now in Spring Framework 5, and we never re in, pra in, 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 in practice, we never really changed our approach anyway. But now in Spring Framework 5 and in any framework on JDK 9, we need to go back to the more defensive model anymore. We cannot assume that JNDI is present, that JXP is present. So any hard references to those things uh, are to be avoided. In Spring, we never had them because historically we grew as a JDK 1.4 Java 5 based framework. Um, so that, that, that's cool, but actually presents presents an issue with some other libraries and frameworks out there. 
um, which bring all sorts of things in because they just expect them to be around. That's not necessarily the case anymore in a JDK 9 setup. Even in a standard JDK 9 setup or JDK 10, 11 setup, um, we might actually have a more reduced version of uh, the class libraries in front of us. Anything else is, uh, is then an optional bonus that we can choose to bring in. So um, this, uh, it might be a little bit on the small end, but this is what the module graph looks like in JDK 9. It's the latest version that I could find. There's actually, it's, it might not be totally up to date with JDK 9 GA, um, but uh, it's like June, June-ish, uh, May-ish from, uh, from this year. So java.base at the bottom, and that's the module dependency graph, right? Java SE as the all-embracing uh, um, uh, umbrella module, and then all the references to Java SQL and the interdependencies where Java SQL depends on Java util logging and, uh, and so forth, right? It's also an interesting choice. I mean, it might be a detail, right? But Java util logging is not active by default anymore. So a standard JDK 9 distribution, a standard, a standard JDK 9 runtime setup does not necessarily have Java util logging. Um, which is kind of an acknowledgement that in many setups you're using log4j2 or logback instead, SLF4j instead. Uh, so the, the whole parallel nature of there's a logging abstraction in the JDK and another one that you bring in actually kind of disappears in JDK 9 because Java util logging is not in by default. And if you don't bring it in, you can just bring in SLF4j and there's no Java util logging kind of conceptually competing with it uh, in your setup. So it's actually a quite nice rep uh, representation, a quite nice acknowledgement that there are some things that JDK has to provide. There are many other things that libraries and frameworks, external libraries and frameworks, are better at providing. So at the application level, this is essentially where, where you, your decision comes into the picture, right? Because if you're using JDK 9, the JDK itself is modular in any case. You can't do anything about it. If you're using JDK 9 in class path mode, the underlying JDK is nevertheless running in Jigsaw. And the class path at runtime is represented as a so-called unnamed module that your deployment then lives within. The class path works fine on JDK 9. There's really nothing wrong with using the class path on JDK 9. Everybody that I know you, uh, embracing JDK 9 right now actually uses the class path on JDK 9. Many of the benefits, the runtime JVM improvements, the new APIs, many of the benefits can be perfectly consumed on the class path on JDK 9. Let's set that straight. If you choose to go onto the module path with your own deployment units, that's a, a choice that you're making. You're opting into the module path then you can choose to bootstrap the JVM instead of dash class path, you're basically uh, with dash module path, dash MP, right? Uh, you're, you're listing a, a module directory, and it's going to pick up jar files, the same jar files, right? Uh, we're, still, we're still deploying jar files at the, at the uh, uh, application level, because the, uh, the four mentioned, the four hinted at JMod format is, only, is a JVM internal format. The, G the JDK class libraries itself are not char files anymore, no RT char. They are internally represented in a more efficient, efficiently loadable format called JMod. But that's JVM internal, not really open uh, for application consumption. For application consumption, if you want to deploy to the module path, you keep building char files. But those char files uh, have to take certain constraints into account. They have to be cleanly separated, uh, coherent content, um, usually uh, select packages wrapped up as one module, no split packages with other jars, uh, no cycles between, the, uh, between modules. Um, so you have to follow certain rules, but in the end you just package up classes and resources as a char file still. And then you have a choice. In, in its full extent, you would ship a module info descriptor. So it's basically a char file with regular content, and the module info descriptor that you add, module info, and we'll see a little snippet on the next slide, module info is like package info. Module info Java, uh, a little bit of formal metadata that the compiler turns into bytecode and that is shipped with your, with your char file. And by putting your char file onto JDK9's module path, the runtime JVM is going to read those module descriptors and to take them into account. So you can control 
dependencies and you can control the visibility of your packages to other modules through a module descriptor. You can control the export of packages and uh, you can even open them up for reflection by other modules. There's, you, can, you can control the surface of your module, essentially. Um, there's another variant, which is quite important in practice, called the automatic module. The automat an, an automatic module is essentially a regular JAR file taking those constraints into account. It still has to follow the rules, but it doesn't have to have a module info descriptor. There's no need to ship a module info class file with it. Instead, there are conventions. Everything is exported by default, like in a regular JAR file, so all the packages are uh, open to other modules to be consumed. And dependencies are automatically resolved at runtime. So if you, if you do this to a particular JAR file and it has a dependency on another JAR file, the runtime system figures out that there needs to be a visibility in, um, in, in the, the module graph needs to make the other module vis visible to yours. So uh, automatic resolution of dependencies essentially. And a manifest entry called automatic module name, literally in the Java manifest uh, for your JAR file. And in that, in, in that manifest entry, you, you choose to declare a, a, a well-defined module name for your module. If you don't do this, it works without an automatic module name uh, manifest entry as well, then the module name is being derived from the char name at runtime. So if you have like jackson dash data bind dash 2.9.2 jar, then it drops the 292 and the dash, jackson dot data bind. It uh, uh, replaces the dash with a dot, jackson dot data bind. That's your automatic module name then unless the JAR file declares an, a, a, an explicit module name entry, you end up with JAR file derived module names at runtime. So it's kind of interesting that there are those different options for deploying to the module path, because afterwards, it's all the same. They are all on the module path, efficiently managed. You can use Java Lang reflect module to reflect upon your module uh, boundaries at runtime. You get all the benefits, but you have different ways of uh, uh, shipping metadata with your modular char files. So this is in, in particular important for transitionary scenarios. And let's be fair, those transitionary scenarios are really, we're talking about a multi-year transition here. Right? Uh, this can be a quite extensive transitionary period. Um, because you might have framework chars out there that you consume from Maven Central some of them might ship automatic module names and take the constraints into account. That's great, right? Spring Framework 5 does this, JUnit 5 does this. There are a few other libraries that start doing this, shipping the automatic module name entries, having well-defined module names independent from the char name. For all the others, not declaring that entry in the manifest, you get the char-derived names, which is not too bad, right? Take the, the checks and chars, check them, take them from Maven Central, and you get quite idiomatic checks and dot data bind style module names through the naming convention. Uh, just don't rename the char file, right? Keep the char file name stable. Uh, the, that's actually the biggest benefit of the, the manifest entry. You can rename your char file, and the module name stays the same. Whereas otherwise, if you rename the char file, of course, the JDBM is going to derive a different name from your renamed char file. Spring Framework 4.3, by the way, does not ship manifest entries. So in Spring Framework 4.3, we, you can use it on, not only on JDK 9, you can do this anyway on the class path. You can use Spring Framework 4.3 on the JDK 9 module path, but you don't get manifest entries. So you always get char-derived module names. That's not too bad, though, because the module namespace that we chose to use actually follows our Maven Central naming conventions anyway. So the spring context module actually declares spring.context as a stable module name. Uh, the spring web MEC module declares spring.webmc. Those are intentionally, and, and, or as a quite nice alignment, those are the same names that you would end up with uh, deriving the, uh, the module name from the char file name with our current choice of uh, char naming at Maven Central. As long as you keep those names in place, it also works for Spring Framework 4.3 the same way. In Spring Framework 5, you can rename the char files to whatever you want, and those names are still going to remain stable. In your module descriptors, in your application modules, where you, for example, choose to use Spring's JDBC template, in order to compile against Spring's JDBC template to actually see it uh, at, at development time and at runtime, 
you need to ship a module in for the scripter that says requires spring.jdbc. That's where those names matter, right? That's why those names have to remain stable. They become a part of your source layout, right? If, and module info descriptors like package info descriptors are compiled, they're actually class files in your char. So you're really baking those module names into the compiled representation that you're shipping. It's not easy to change those names. If string.jdbc all of a sudden has a different module name at runtime, those modules wouldn't resolve. You would have to recompile them and change the name in your source code. Pretty unpleasant. That's why those names have to remain stable. At least for um, the purposes of a particular project, they have to remain stable. That's uh, the name of your own module, right? Uh, uh, modules allow you to choose a, a module name of your own for each and every module. Um, and of course, if, uh, if you don't declare exports conventions, then you still have export everything. If you only want to export certain packages, start adding exports declarations for the packages that you actually want to export here. It's that the module, module descriptor format is actually quite nice. It can be very concise if you have no special requirements. And it allows you to fine tune the dependencies and the visibilities of your module if you really need to. It's quite nicely designed. So that's something you can opt into. And from our perspective, from the Spring Framework perspective, we, we ship a, uh, a variant of our, our framework here in Spring Framework 5 that is prepared to be used on the module path, uh, even going, uh, doing the obvious in terms of stable module names with the module name manifest entries and everything, allowing you to consume the framework on the JDK9 module path if you choose to do so. Otherwise, Keep using, keep using your spring-based setup on the class path and it's all going to work fine, of course. Right, there's one special note that I've only very briefly hinted at. Um, there's, a, there's two different forms of exporting classes for other modules. Um, the standard version is actually named export, so it's like an export um, uh, declaration in, in, in your model descriptor. Exporting means making certain packages visible, the public types in certain packages visible and usable uh, for, for other modules. Opening, so the, the other variant, is slightly more advanced. Export basically just means what I could do before with public types is now still possible. Um, opening means allowing other modules to reflect into your types beyond the public surface. So export is basically public only. Make what you declared as public, the public classes, public constructors, public methods, that's what the other module is seeing. Opening means the other module may go deeper. It may reflect into your class. It may, it may start to read private fields. It may invoke non-public constructors. It may dispatch to non-public methods. That's what opens allows for. So there's a degree of control that you have here. In a standard module setup, just with exports clauses or standard exports rules, standard exports conventions, reflection into your classes is not allowed. Spring, Hibernate, Jackson, none of them is allowed to reflect into your classes. They can actually see the structure of your classes, but they can't read the fields, they can't invoke the methods, they can't call the constructors. This is not as big a deal in practice as you may, may think, um, because in practice, if the interaction needs between a framework and your classes are all public, are all going through public artifacts. There is no problem, right? So in, in spring terms, for example, if your dependency injection points are all public methods, public constructors, if your handler methods in spring MVC are all public methods on public classes, there is no need to use opening, to use open here. You can just export, use the standard export conventions, it's all going to work fine. With data binding frameworks such as Hibernate and, um, and Jackson, it may be a little different, right? If you want them to do direct field binding to your private fields, you have to open your types. And op opening is quite flexible. In your module descriptor, you can choose to open certain packages to certain other modules. So not to everybody else, but just to Hibernate or just to Spring. Or you generally open them, let everybody else reflect into them. Um, it's, it's your choice, but it's something you only have to do if there's an actual need to go beyond the public surface of your types. I would, for spring purposes, strongly recommend to go with public signatures. 
public constructors, public classes, public handler methods. And then you, have not, uh, then you have no problem here, and you have a very clean design that's also nicely testable. So I definitely recommend uh, trying to reduce the need for opening your packages. Spring is certainly ready for it. Um, it's, it, it, we can even warn you to some degree. We're going to see auto-wired annotations on non-public types. We're going to try to invoke them. We're going to fail. So you're not silently skipping them. This, it's kind of still fail early. Um, so you're also going to notice if, 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 if there's a mismatch, right? The development model is actually quite nice in practice. All right, so for the final, final few minutes, uh, the upgrade recommendations. I've, I've hinted at quite a few things already, right? By all means, if you have a larger setup with third-party frameworks and libraries brought in here, stay on the class path initially, right, for the time being. Upgrade to JDK 9, switch your Java home to 9, run the existing setup on 9, um, consume the runtime benefits, maybe even start using source 9 language level and start using map off, set off, list off, um, do all those things happily on the class path. Uh, you're going to have a significantly easier upgrade experience, of course, in particular with uh, the likes of Hibernate and Jackson uh, and so forth involved, or with uh, um, more extensive uh, container environments that you're trying to run online. Um, there's there is a, an even more defensive variant, staying with the Java 8 bytecode level. Um, this is essentially trying to uh, reduce the uh, exposure to a tooling uh, that is unable to handle new bytecode levels. So by compiling with target 1.8, but deploying to Java 9 or 10 or 11, um, all the existing tools like uh, ASM, existing ASM versions, existing CGLI versions, existing Java Assist versions are going to only see Java 8 bytecode level because your classes are compiled with that level, right? So whenever there's a class path scan, somebody's trying to read those classes, somebody's trying to create a proxy for those classes, a proxy type, um, there's no need to ever encounter a new bytecode level. This, this may, so if, if, the, if, if a straight upgrade to Java 9 at the Java 9 language level breaks some of your tools uh, that are in place, could also be build time tools, but in particular runtime uh, tools, if it breaks it, say target 1.8, explicitly enforce compilation to produce Java 8 bytecode level, and all of a sudden it might all work fine for your purposes for the time being, right? That might be a quite nice compromise in an immediate upgrade path. You could even go as far, if, if, you, if you choose to stay at, the, uh, at Java 8 bytecode level, you could even compile against JDK 9, keep your build running against JDK 9, and only really, literally only deploy to JDK 9. Build on 8, deploy to 9. You, you still get all the runtime benefits. So there are several degrees of Java 9 adoption that you could consider here. Some of them um, more defensive and uh, uh, having a very, very high chance of surviving an, an even a naive smoke test uh, of a larger application setup. Now we have to uh, finally, right, also cover the, the JDK 9 and the 11 angle. Uh, this is actually, oh, we are wrapping up now. Uh, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a summary as well. The, uh, the adoption of JDK 9 really means you're also uh, on the train to 10 and 11. So you really need to also follow the upgrades to 10 and 11. This is not so unusual uh, in, in other, uh, for other kinds of software. If you think about Chrome or Firefox or even Android and iOS and now, are you really hanging on to a particular version of Chrome for all too long? Are you really supposed to? In, in, in the JDK, we are basically seeing a similar release pattern emerging, right? You're not supposed to hang on to nine. You're not supposed to hang on to 10. They are going to, to, to stop shipping update releases uh, the moment that the next generation comes out. So nine until March, then 10 comes out, you're supposed to be on 10. No nine updates anymore, not even for vulnerabilities. Um, and you're supposed to be on 10. And then in September 2018, when 11 comes out, you're supposed to upgrade to 11. And then you can stay on 11 because 11 is a long-term support release with at least three years of uh, patch releases and very likely significantly longer commercial maintenance phases. Maybe not as long as for Java 8, but similarly long, so five to six years uh, for extended support contracts. It's nevertheless a good idea to uh, 
familiarize yourself with nine now, right? Because if you know that your setup is ready for nine, even if you're not embracing it quite yet, you, can, you know that the upgrade to, to 10 and 11, to 11 in particular, is going to be very streamlined. So you can still do the initial tests, but of course this model suggests that you're only trying nine or developing against nine for the moment, that you're not using nine in production. Unfortunately, that's kind of the downside of that release model. Um, most people are going to wait for JDK 11 before considering an upgrade in production beyond JDK 8. In uh, the Spring world itself, uh, we actually keep the Spring framework project itself buildable on 8, 9, and even 10 early access. So you can take what we have on GitHub and just uh, uh, um, run it, switch Java Home to 9, switch Java Home to 10 EA, run the entire build, uh, run the entire integration tests at the core framework level. They're all going to pass. We expect that to um, stay the same for JDK 11. We are not aware of any potential breakages uh, because the way that we are handling uh, new JDK levels is actually very, um, it's kind of unique. We use an ASM fork that leniently, leniently accepts new bytecode levels. So uh, there's, there's no issue with us encountering a new bytecode level in class path scanning. We have some measures in place that are even at this point already prepared for JDK 10 and 11. So the whole point is uh, Spring Framework 5.0 is designed with the Java 8 baseline, designed to embrace 9. At the same time, it is ready for 10 and 11 to the degree where you should be able to, to use existing Spring Framework 5.0.2 or 5.0.3 releases and next year run them without upgrading Spring Framework on JDK 11 and, and it should just work. I mean, in practice, I would recommend an upgrade to the latest Spring Framework 5.0 patch release, but uh, just making a point that it is technically, technically set up to be usable on forthcoming JDK generations without the required framework upgrade on our end. That's the goal that we want to move towards because we're going to continue like this. After JDK 10, there's going to be, uh, not only 11, there's going to be JDK 12 in March 2019, JDK 13 in, uh, in, in September 2019, right? It's going to continue like this. And we'd like to, uh, we'd like to be uh, forward compatible with those JDK generations uh, at any given point to the best possible degree. All right. So much really for the, uh, this rather extensive coverage of our story around GDK 8, 9, and, and higher. Um, any, any questions? Right. We, we are currently, so the question is multi-release jars, uh, and in, in, in all brevity, uh, we are not currently using multi-release jars, but JUnit 5.1, for example, is doing this for its uh, detect test classes in a named module uh, function, uh, feature. It's, it's actually using multi-release jars to, to have the uh, module Java Lang reflect module interaction. Um, in, in Spring Framework, we tend to reflectively uh, uh, support those things. So we have like a canonical implementation of the class that says, if I'm on nine, do this, right? So uh, multi-release jars are one way of modeling uh, differences in behavior between uh, different JDK generations, not the only way. And it, it, the only practical usage that I am personally aware of is literally in JUnit 5.1 M1, where they're using multi-release jars. It's the first use that I've seen. So it's definitely useful to quite a lot, to quite a few cases. Uh, we don't see us uh, using it though at this point. So who's, who's, who's motivated to, to, to give JDK 9 a try in the near future? Are you all prepared to upgrade to 10 and 11? Yeah? <laughs> cool, you have to. <laughs> now, all right, well, um, if there are any further questions, please come up to the, uh, uh, to, to the stage. I'm happy to continue the discussion to any length. Thanks for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the show.